Hi everyone, this is the start of two to three lectures on chapter six, which covers microbial nutrition. In this particular mini lecture, we'll be talking about nutrition and transport mechanisms, and basically how bacteria eat or how they get the things that they need. Microbial nutrition is what bacteria get to survive. It is from their habitat. So bacteria require a constant influx of certain substances from their habitat. All of the organisms require a number of different elements. There's a list here on this slide that tells you all of the different ones. So they need to find a source for these elements. And a vocabulary word here, essential nutrient, this is any substance that has to be provided to an organism, something that they need to have provided to them to survive. So what do microbes eat? We have two main categories. The first is the heterotrophs, and these actually require carbon in its organic form. They must get it from their environment somehow. Whereas in an autotroph, they can actually take inorganic carbon dioxide and use that so they will break it down, convert it into organic compounds within their cell. So they have an ability to actually do it on their own. And so they're not actually nutritionally dependent on other living things. That would be the main difference between the heterotroph and the autotrophs. Heterotrophs actually are dependent on other living things to get their carbon. So we have other breakdowns within this, within the heterotrophs. We have what are called phototrophs, and these are microbes that can photosynthesize. So they generally have something like chlorophyll in them that can actually take sunlight and convert that into, uh, into organic molecules. And then we have chemotrophs, and these are microbes that can gain energy from chemical compounds. So they bring chemical compounds into the cell. They're able to break that down and use that to make energy that the cell can use. So how do microbes eat? How do they actually get these nutrients into the cell? And there's a number of different mechanisms. We'll kind of start at the basic, moving towards the more complicated. Uh, transport occurs across a cell membrane, and that is true even in organisms with cell walls. The transport must actually bring those necessary nutrients across the cell membrane. And so what is the driving force of this is that transport is either atomic or molecular movement. So taking something, either the atoms or the molecules, and actually moving them across the membrane. So the most basic form of this would be what is called diffusion, and this is where we have atoms or molecules that are concentrated on one side of a barrier and moving across that barrier to a less concentrated area. And this is a nice example. Let's say you have a cup of coffee or tea. If you put a sugar cube at the bottom of it, because the sugar cube is more concentrated with those sugar molecules than the rest of the liquid, those will then break up, move about, and eventually disperse themselves evenly throughout that liquid. So that's just the basic idea of diffusion of molecules in an aqueous solution. So that is actually the dispersion of solutes, something like a compound. But when we start looking at just the movement of water, so in and out of a cell, if we're talking about the movement of water, that is referred to as osmosis. So if we ever talk about osmosis, you know that the only movement here is of water. And this is the diffusion of water through a selectively permeable membrane, meaning that it is permeable to water. Water can move either inside or outside of the membrane, but the actual larger solutes are stuck on whatever side that they are on. So when we look at a membrane that's put between two solutions and one side of the solution has lots of solutes and very little water versus maybe the outer portion that has lots of water. The water will be able to diffuse, but the solutes won't. So what's going to happen is the water will move to the area where there are more solutes and try to dilute that. And what will end up happening is this will continue until the concentration of the water is equalized on both sides of the membrane. So we have a number of different ways that this can be seen in nature. This is a great diagram of showing you what would happen to a cell depending on what kind of a solution it's put into. 
So once again, this is only looking at osmosis, meaning the movement of water. We're not looking at these solutes being able to move. The membrane would be impermeable to those solutes moving. So the only way that we can kind of regulate is through that movement of water. So if we look at cells within the cell wall, or this one is even showing one without a cell wall, the things that you want to look at down at the key here, we have solutes are these light blue dots. And then the arrows are the direction that water will move. So this first column here showing two different types of cells is in an isotonic solution. That means that there are the same number of solutes in the cell as there are outside of the cell. So what we'll see is we, we have water movement in and out of the cell, but it'll be at a uh, same rate going in and out of the cell since we don't have more solute, solutes in or outside of the cell. And this will keep it like this for equilibrium. And that is kind of a nice way for a cell to be. It's feeling very comfortable. It's in a solution that is very similar to what it's like inside. But let's say that we put it into what is called a hypotonic solution. And a hypotonic solution means that the water outside of the cell or the liquid outside of the cell has less solutes in it. It has more water and less solutes. What's going to happen in this case is that the water is going to want to diffuse into the cell and dilute that more concentrated solute in the cell. So we can see here that as that water comes in, that cell will have a tendency then to swell up because it's bringing more water in to make those solutes more dilute. And you can see up in the picture here, it actually will put pressure against the cell wall. Now the cell wall will generally prevent the cell from bursting. I suppose if enough water got in, it could burst the, the cell wall, but this puts a tension kind of against that cell wall. So this is hypotonic, meaning that the solution outside of the cell has less solutes. It's more water heavy. If we look at the opposite type of solution, what is called a hypertonic solution, this means that there are more solutes outside of the cell and we have more water in the cell. Well, the water is going to want to leave the cell to try to dilute that very concentrated liquid outside of the cell. And what you'll see is that the cell is actually going to shrink within that cell membrane or if we have this normal sized cell, as it sends water out to try to dilute the solutes, the cell is actually going to shrink and it becomes very distorted looking. And this can actually be very dangerous to a cell too. So this, if you want to think about it as salt, this would be that the salt solutes are the same as what's inside the cell. So we have this nice equilibrium. In this case, maybe the cell has more salt inside of it. So it starts bringing in water, trying to dilute it, makes it kind of get big and swell. Or in this case, let's say that you put a cell into some salt water it's going to try to send water out into the environment to dilute that, and that's going to cause the cell to shrink. This is kind of a, a complicated concept. Make sure that you understand this moving forward. If you have questions on it, I'm happy to go over it a little bit more in detail, but this is kind of to give you an idea of what a cell does uh, in differing osmotic content. So when we talk about osmosis, the cell membranes and the cell walls can hinder diffusion by being a physical barrier. Generally speaking, water will be able to go through it, but often large polar molecules and ions have a difficult time crossing the plasma membrane. They can't kind of do what water does. They get either stuck on the inside or the outside of a cell. So if a cell has nutrients that it wants to bring into the cell, how does it do that? And there's a number of different ways. This is a great figure in your book. This is a good one to refer back to, and you'll kind of get a good idea on how the cell does it. So at the very top of this, we have passive transport, and this is basically simple diffusion. It's what we talked about, about that sugar cube in T. So basically in this, the concentration of that substance will be such a high gradient, and it will be permitted to pass through. So this would be one that the actual cell membrane allows to come through, through simple di uh, diffusion. It does not require energy because it's going with the concentration gradient, meaning it's going from very crowded to less crowded.
The next one that we would have is facilitated diffusion. This is another one that does not require energy. And this is that there's an actual molecule in the cell membrane that the solute can bind to, and it will actually pass through the cell membrane into the cytoplasm. This one does not require any energy, and it moves substances from a higher concentration to a lower concentration, okay? It is limited somewhat by how many binding sites it has, so as they fill, it can move as much as it can actually bind. Now starting here with active transport processes in the cell, these will always require ATP or energy. So the difference really between passive and active is that they always require energy. And the other thing is that generally speaking, especially when we're looking at carrier mediated active transport, they're going against the gradient. So it will be less concentrated outside than it is inside, and yet we're still moving those molecules in. So we're kind of moving from a less crowded space to a more crowded space. And this is why this requires ATP. It's against that concentration gradient. So on this one, there's specialized receptors that the solutes can bind to. ATP is used to then transport those molecules inside the cell. So this is the first one, carrier-mediated active transport, the carrier being this protein receptor. The next one that we have is group translocation. And this is molecules that move across together with other molecules. So there will be a number of different molecules. ATP will be used so energy is needed. And it will convert these molecules into a useful, a metabolically useful substance in that transport. This again is often against the concentration gradient and it requires that ATP to get this going. The last one that we see is bulk transport and this often has to do with either phagocytosis or pinocytosis. Phagocytosis is the, refers to actual particles being engulfed by the cell and endocytosis refers to I'm sorry, penocytosis actually refers to liquids being moved into the cell. And these both, again, require ATP. They take energy. So to keep in mind here, being able to divide these into what is considered needing energy and which ones don't, the top two here are passive, meaning they don't require ATP. They are done with the concentration gradient. Things from a higher concentrate are moved to, to lower concentration. In the second grouping, which is the last three here, this is active transport. These do require ATP, and they often are moving solutes from a less concentrated area to a more concentrated area. So this is section 6.1 in your book. Hopefully this clarified some of it a little bit for you. If you have any more questions, please don't hesitate to contact me, and I hope that that all makes sense. Thanks.